Hey guys, and welcome to a video, or rather a series of videos that I'm really, really looking forward to making. So uh, this is going to be uh, a new series of videos on two uh, topics within the realm of chess improvement. And these are two very broad topics that I think do not get enough coverage um, on YouTube and, and on Twitch and in chess literature. And as I'll explain, the second issue I have with these topics is that when they are tackled, I think that it's not done in a manner that's particularly systematic or conducive to mastery. And I'm gonna to try to take on the very ambitious task of rectifying that. And these two topics are principles of the end game and principles of positional play or just positional, positional play, positional concepts. So over the course of the next couple of months, I'm gonna make a bunch of these videos on what I believe to be the most important endgame principles and themes and the most important principles and themes within the realm of positional chess. So today we're talking about king activity, but uh, we're going to try to cover as many important concepts as possible. We're gonna talk about weak squares, pawn structure, uh, maneuvers, all of those nitty gritty in positional chess and endgames that you might be fearing or you might think only GMs kind of can do, I'm going to try to demystify and present in a relatively coherent manner. Now, the big thing that I'm going to be doing, and this is really the guiding method behind these videos, is that rather than focusing on just one example and spending 30 minutes on it, I'm going to try to go, uh, I'm going to try to go for breadth here. I'm going to show at the very least four to five examples per video, because I believe that much like tactics, it's not enough uh, to show somebody what a pin is, right? You then have to give that person five or six examples at a minimum uh, so that they can see the various manifestations, uh, you know, and what to look for. It's not enough just to explain. You also have to drill it down. And that's what I'm going to be trying to do with positional chess and with endgames. I feel like they can be learned in a very similar manner to tactical themes. Uh, and that is by looking at several examples all at once and uh, really getting that pattern recognition in place as early as possible. So with that ambitious goal in mind, let's begin. And today we're going to start with what is perhaps the single most important principle of the end game, uh, which is king activity. You must keep your king active at all costs in the vast majority of end game positions. And uh, we are going to take a look at what exactly that even means, and where we have some fascinating endgames ahead of us. The last thing I'll say before we jump in, uh, and I won't be making this uh, you know, long-winded introduction and subsequent videos on these topics, uh, but I will be going relatively fast on, on all of these examples. So feel free to pause the video, uh, you know, set this up on your own board. Again, I'm gonna try to fit five examples within 30 minutes, so uh, there, there will be moments within these games where I'm not focusing on interesting stuff just because it's beyond the purview of what we're talking about. But that doesn't mean you can't explore things and you can't learn from, uh, from these games in ways other than as an illustration of, of the topic. So, uh, so by all means, feel free to structure this in the way that is most conducive to your learning. And let's start with a uh, classic example that I showed all of my students, I feel like everybody should know it because it is perhaps the single most clear illustration of how much king activity changes the landscape of an end game. This is a game between uh, Cuban world champion Jose Raul Capablanca, uh, fourth world champion, and Savelli Tartacauer, uh, who was one of the uh, strongest players of the early 20th century. Uh, I believe he was uh, later given the grandmaster title by Fide toward the end of his life. And uh, Capablanca and Tartakauer have reached a really interesting endgame. Material is currently equal, five pawns each. Uh, but you might see that white has this protected pass pawn on g5. And of course, we will also talk about pass pawns in, uh, in a subsequent video. But if you look a little bit more carefully, you'll see that there is a bit of a problem. White has this incredibly weak pawn on c3 and a weak pawn on a4. And that pawn cannot be defended. White's rook, although it's on the seventh rank, it cannot return to defend this pawn. It looks like white's not only going to lose this pawn, but the king is going to be tossed back to the second rank. And this g-pawn alone is not going to decide the game in white's favor. Because after g6, even the rook can simply capture on g6. And after rook takes c7, rook g7, black is totally fine. Uh, the position is approximately equal. Uh, what else could white try? White could try to hunt for the d5 pawn. But 
that kind of loses focus. Rook takes c3, king e2, black can defend it with c6. And if white pushes g6, that doesn't do as much as it seems to, because after rook g3, the rook is behind the pass pawn. At the very least, uh, black's position is very comfortable. The game should end in a draw. But it turns out that in this position, white is winning with an absolutely brilliant maneuver, one of my favorite endgame maneuvers. Capablanca realized that these pawns do not matter. The only thing that matters is the fact that after black takes on c3, white's king is going to be tossed back to the second rank, and that cannot be allowed. Capablanca thought about it and realized that the king actually has a pathway toward black's side of the position where it can support this crucial pass pawn on g5. Capablanca plays the move king g3. Tartakauer takes on c3 and the king turns the corner. King h4. The whole point here is that the king is going to walk up through h5 to g6 or through an alternate path that I'm about to reveal. And once the king gets into black side of the board, it's going to be so much easier to push this pawn. White's king, rook, and pawn are going to overwhelm black's rook because black's king unlike its counterpart, is completely cut off along the 8th rank. Watch what happens. Tartakauer continues to go after white's pawns. Now, king h5 was possible, but Capablanca finds an even more efficient way of getting the king straight into the heart of black's position. The king diagonally... Whoops. Apologies for that. The king diagonally crosses its way to f6. Tartakauer can take all the pawns that he wants. He does. He takes on f4. He can even take the pawn on d4, but... As my good friend Robert Hess says, it's not about the quantity of the pass pawns, it's only about the quality. You can have a single pass pawn, but that pass pawn decides the game. After king f6, you're threatening mate, the rook swings over, and now checkmate is simply unstoppable. We're not even talking about promotion here, we're talking about mate. So Tartakauer, instead of taking on d4, he goes rook e4, tries to keep the rook on an open file. Capablanca slides into f6, threatening mate, rook g7 check, forcing black's king onto an awkward spot. Now Capablanca simply starts collecting all of black's pawns. Rook c8 is a mate threat. The king collects the pawn on f5. Goes back to f6 in order to keep black's rook passive. Rook c8 mate is there. And look at how much mileage white is squeezing out of that king. Now after rook f4 check, the king goes on to greener pastures. Goes on to e5 in order to collect the d5 pawn. g7 check, another uh, very nice move by Josero Capablanca. One of the great things about having your king active in the endgame is that almost all pawn endgames are going to be winning when there is such a disparity in king activity. Normally, if black's king was on b4 or d7, the game would end in a draw. But because white's king is so active, this endgame is an elementary win. The simplest way to win simply being to slide the king over to b7 and win all of black's pawns. It's like watching Lionel Messi on the soccer field. If you like, the king was on f6 one second and it's on b7 the other. Tartakauer can't take the pawn. And Capablanca completes the job by taking two more of Black's pawns and winning by promoting the D-pawn. Tartakar could have resigned a little bit earlier. He resigned here because the D-pawn is entirely unstoppable. A relatively simple example, but nonetheless, this shows the incredible power, how much activating your king in almost any type of endgame can totally transform the landscape of the position. Moving on. Moving on. We have the following position from Akiba Rubinstein's game. Akiba Rubinstein, also an early 20th century player uh, and one of the greatest endgame players of that generation of that time. This is also a relatively famous game. Now it's black to play. White has just played the move rook to c1 offering a rook trade. And a quick look reveals that black really cannot refuse that trade because if black goes down to h4, white's rook infiltrates to c7 and all of black's pawns fall. So Rubinstein takes on c1 and the king takes. Now, you might notice that there is a disparity in the pawn structure. Black's pawn structure is so much better than white's, but in a pawn endgame, pawn structure might not matter because the position could get locked up and then the game ends in a draw. Now, the advice that you often get in these types of positions is to go toward the center. But very importantly, what this game reveals is that king activity does not just mean going blindly toward the center of the board in any kind of endgame. It means very mindfully and very carefully charting the right path for the king. The king is capable of great things, but you have to know where you're going and why. If you go toward the center, you're not going to get much done because white's king is right in time to stop the infiltration to c4. And even though white's pawns are weak, there's nothing to attack them. So instead of going toward the center, Rubenstein realized that the target square for black's king is on h3. And that is because this pawn on h2 is white's biggest weakness. And what happens in the game is that Rubenstein makes a beeline straight for that square, White's king barely, barely manages to reach g1, but it doesn't matter. Again, look at the disparity in king activity. 
that disparity is transformed into a very confident win with a relatively simple but nonetheless very nice plan. Rubenstein now realizes that what he needs to do is clear kind of, you know, it's like when you're walking with an axe and clearing all the trees, he will have to get his king over to g3. Now, what does that entail? Well, that means he'll have to trade the pawns on h2 and f2, and he has just the tools to do that because white is totally paralyzed. First, he goes e5, freezing white's pawns. Now he goes b5, not strictly necessary, but he wanted to make sure that white doesn't have any extra moves on the other side. Boom, boom, boom. All pawns of the fourth ring. G4, there goes one pawn. Okay, Cone goes e4, trying to mix things up. Obviously, g takes f3 would be very inadvisable. Always got to be careful. Rubenstein plays f takes e4. And now he plays h4 and g3. And the game is over. White is essentially forced to trade both of these pawns. And after hg3, hg3, Eric Cone resigned. Because if he takes on g3, then the king takes, walks up to f3, takes this pawn, and the game is over. If white tries uh, f3, then black can win either with g2 or with a6, but the move g2 is probably the simplest win, f4. It looks like white's broken through and white's promoted, but again, all because of the king activity. This is not to be feared. King g3, e6, and now a very typical mating sequence. Funnily enough, black could even troll with a move like a6, even let white promote. And if this isn't an illustration of the importance of, of king activity, then I don't know what is. So once again, it's all about charting the right path, particularly in pawn endgames. Do not go blindly toward the center. Try to find the right target square for your king and get the most mileage out of it. And speaking of mileage, let's take a look at one of my games. Um, from right about 12 years ago against uh, Benjamin Bach, we, neither of us were, were grandmasters at the time this game was played. Uh, but I think this is also a good illustration of the fact that even in queen end games, even when your opponent has uh, has an active queen, it doesn't matter. The king can overpower even the queen in the right kind of situation. Okay, so we have a queen end game. Materials equal six pawns apiece. But if you look carefully at the pawn structure, you might notice two things. First is that black has this very weak backward pawn on f6, and it's fixed by the pawn on e4. Now, that might not matter because white doesn't have many pieces left, but that's something to keep in mind. The second thing, perhaps even more important, is that we have the potential to create a pass pawn with h4. And I was very tempted to play h4 here. Why didn't I do that? Because after the trade, black's queen swings back to the blockading post on h6, and white simply cannot make any progress without allowing black to create a pass pawn of his own with f5. So if we go h5, we yield the g5 square, black goes f5, and the pass pawns kind of cancel each other out. There's going to be perpetual check. The king is simply not able to escape the queen's checks. And black can even push uh, his pawn if, he, if he's so inclined. Uh, if we don't go h5, if we go king h3, and then the queen can just, for example, park itself on f4. f5 is threatened. If you try queen g4, obviously black will not trade. Black will simply continue checking. White is unable to make progress here. So with that, without uh, eliminated, I started to kind of get scared. I thought, well, I've got this advantage, I've got this advantage, but maybe that can't be transformed into anything. And then I remembered something. I remembered that my king actually had legs. I don't need to keep it on g2, nor do I need to hurry with a move h4. I can't use my queen to attack f6 because the queen is guarding this very important d2 square. We do not want to allow this, or rather queen c2 is more accurate. We do not want to allow black to take all of my queen side pawns. So let's keep the queen on e2. Let's make the king work for it. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. The king all the way to g6 in four moves. There was nothing black could have done to stop it. And this makes all the difference. I slid it all the way up to g7. And now when I move my queen to the uh, f file, the f pawn is immediately going to be under attack. Plus, if I ever push my h pawn, which happens very soon, uh, I call this kind of rolling out the red carpet. Once the pawn reaches h6, the king will be able to supervise the pawn's progress all the way to promotion, which frees up the white queen to do stuff like block checks or cover important squares or attack the f6 pawn or all three of them. Benjamin tries to desperately prevent me from getting a pass pawn. He plays g4. That's an ingenious move. Queen takes g4. He takes on h2, but it doesn't matter. This pawn on f6 is what kills black. Queen. Okay, I went a4 first. Uh, don't want to give him any any pawns. My king on g7 is a perfectly safe and b immune from any checks whatsoever. Queen d2, queen g6. Now white is threatening uh, queen f7 and then queen takes f6. So Benjamin steps aside with his king. Of course, you don't want to take on f6 and give up g3. So I play g4. And Benjamin goes queen g3. One really nice illustration 
of how important king activity is even in the queen endgame would have happened if black played queen f4. So what happens here? White can force a queen trade, but black can play the very clever move king e7. And if you look carefully, you'll see that the point is that white cannot take on f4. Black gets an unstoppable pass pawn. But you might also see that black is essentially in Zugzwang. The queen can't move, otherwise you lose f6. The king can't move because you lose f6. Black only has two moves at his disposal, and that is to push the pawn up to c6 and then up to c5. All white has to do is wait it out. King g6, c6, king g7, c5, king g6, and finally black is in Zugzwang. If black takes the queen, we play g takes f5. This is king activity at its finest. Black has to step aside and give up f6 and lose. So after g4, Benjamin went queen g3, queen f5 check, king takes f6, and that's it. I've won the pawn, and the rest is very easy. We simply promote this pawn. Every square along the g-file is protected. And at this point, notice that I don't really care about my queen side pawns anymore. I have judged that my pawn is sufficiently far advanced that we can essentially give up all three of these pawns because we are so close to promoting. Queen a2, queen e6, cutting off the queen's control of the promotion square. And now the king hides on f8. And then queen f5. If he went queen c5 check after king e8, there are simply no more checks. So Benjamin checks me from the other side. King f8. If queen d8 check, look at this. King f7 and the queen very nicely covers all of the potential checking squares. Queen f4, queen f5. Last attempt by Benjamin to pin my pawn. And after king f7, finally black is out of checks. Promotion is unstoppable. Just one little funny detail. A little bit outside the scope of what we're talking about. Benjamin made a couple more moves. In this position... I went queen d5 check and he resigned. But can you spot a really, really cute tactic? There was actually a mate in two and it was quite a beautiful one. There was the move queen c6 check, which I saw, but I was afraid to play it. I didn't want to spoil the game. I thought maybe I'm hallucinating, but turned out I wasn't. This is indeed checkmate. Uh, so that existed, but I decided to win the game in more mundane fashion. Notice the king ends the game on g7. It started the game on g2. It went all the way up and that did the trick. Okay. Now, so far we've looked at pretty much balanced, uh, balanced endgames, but let's take a look at how king activity can actually help you turn around a completely lost position. Sometimes going into a lost endgame is the only way to save yourself from a checkmating attack. So I played this game about 10 years ago against the Grandmaster, Hungarian GM Tibor Fagarashi, who played a phenomenal middle game. He was crushing me and I was forced to give up a piece and get the game into what seems like a completely hopeless endgame. White is literally up a full knight. I don't even have a pawn for it. And to, to make matters worse, white has this uh, protected outside pass pawn. So even a pawn endgame, even if white gives up the knight, is still going to be lost. I was thinking about resigning here, but then I decided I'll try one last little crazy idea. And that crazy idea involves trying to run the king up the board as quickly as possible and use my pass d pawn to create last ditch counterplay. Watch what happens. King d6. Okay, he brings his knight back out of the dead. I played rook takes h3, at least taking a single pawn. After knight e8 check came the important crossroads. I think a lot of people's instinct here would be to drop back to d7 in order not to give up the e6 pawn. What you have to understand, particularly when you're down material, is that king activity is so much more important than clinging to a single pawn. Not always, but in this case, it is. After king d7, knight g7, white wins the pawn anyway. And the king is uh, sort of stuck in the doldrum. So I figured, all right, Sparta, king c5, knight c7, king c4, I don't care. Knight takes c6, and now I get to play d4. And something interesting happens. My opponent took a really long time here, and he couldn't come up with a move. He got into severe time pressure. Eventually, he plays the very inaccurate move, rook e4, which is tempting. The best move, by the way, would have been this pretty interesting maneuver, rook d1 forcing me to push the pawn, and now back to e1. The whole point is that this pawn on d3 stops the king from coming to d3. And if black tries rook h2, white gives a check. And after king d5, another check. And the beautiful point of this is after king c4, white actually has check hit on c5. So king activity comes back to bite black, but this is not easy to spot, particularly given that I think my opponent had already relaxed. After rook e4, he had completely forgotten that my rook can start checking him. Rook h1, rook h2. He covers with the rook, and I come back to uh, h1. And now I'm threatening to move my rook to b1, and if white's not careful, then black's going to start having winning chances once I win this pawn on b2. It's all because my king restricts white's king and stops it from coming to d3. My opponent 
having thought for a long time, almost ran out of time and kind of panicked, he decided to repeat moves. But again, it turns out that he could have essentially reverted to the other line and played king c1. And after d3, white has this really cool maneuver with rookie 4 and rookie 5 again. But he simply missed it. It fell out of his field of vision. You don't usually look for checkmates in the endgame. And in this way, of course, it involved some luck. But I was able to salvage this, this endgame down a night against the GM. It was all because I decided, as a desperate attempt, to activate my king uh, and not to keep it passive on d7 and try to cling to my pawns. And um, as our final example, I want to take a look at my all-time favorite example. The first one, the Capablanca game, is my favorite illustration of the importance of king activity. But this last game is my favorite application of uh, the rule that you have to keep your king as active as possible in the end game. This is an absolute treat. Okay, I don't know why it fast forwards until the end of the game, but don't worry, no, no spoilers were, were revealed. Now, this game was shown to me by my coach, Lef Psahis, uh, Grandmaster, who was playing white against uh, Mark Hebden, uh, English Grandmaster, and this was the World Junior Championship in the 1980s, so neither of these players were, was a GM at the time this game was played. Psachis has played an excellent game. As you can see, he is up a pawn. He's got a protected and extra passer on b4. And what's more, he's got complete and total domination over all sides of the board. Black is entirely paralyzed. Now, if we make a random move for white, you can see that black is just unable to move. The queen can't move because of queen f6 check. The rook can't move because you drop f7, either with the queen or the bishop. Black's basically only thing that he could do is just go back and forth from a7 to b6. Uh, the king can't even move because, again, you'll drop f7. But the frustrating thing is that it's not enough to get this situation. You actually have to win. And winning is hard because we have opposite colored bishops, and this b-pawn isn't able to reach b6. This is a dark square, and black has control over it. Okay, now are there any tactics? Bishop takes f7 was considered by Psahis. And if rook takes f7, there's a check on g6. Unfortunately, black takes the queen. And there are no discoveries, no available discoveries here for white. So he thought and thought and thought. Maybe maybe go c4. But then you yield this really nice outpost for the bishop. And eventually, Psahis came up with uh, really... I don't think I'm overstating the case by saying that it's one of the most brilliant uh, endgame ideas that I have seen. Because... It's not the end game yet. The queens are still on the board. I would still classify this as a middle game. But what Psyhus realizes is that one of the weapons at White's disposal is a queen trade. And the way that White can orchestrate a queen trade, potentially, is to play the move bishop c6 and then to play the move queen to d7. Now, the problem with forcing a queen trade prematurely, and this is sort of me imitating what Psyhus is thinking, is that even in an end game, Black is quickly going to get the rook to the open file. White's rook on f3 is no longer applying significant pressure on the f-pawn, and black has excellent drawing chances. But, thought Psyhis, what if in this situation the white king magically teleported its way over, let's say, to c6? Well, that would make all the difference, right? Because black's pawns would collapse. But white doesn't have time to get it there. The king doesn't fly. And after rook a8, king e2, you're not even close to, to being in time. The king has to remain and, and defend these pawns. Okay, so is there any solution to this problem? Well, the solution, as hopefully you have kind of by now thought about, is to first bring the king over to the queen side and then to trade queens. Literally, king f1, king e2, king d3. At this point, Hebden probably thought Psahis was going to stop there, but no, king c4. Okay, now here black, white has to be a little bit careful. If you go up to b5, you might get a nasty check on b6. So Psahis kind of reaches the checkpoint in the video game. He drops it back to b3. Again, white is threatening queen f6 check, so the queen must return to e7. First, Psahis fixes the pawn structure. Note these moves. We've seen them a couple of times today. We've seen Rubenstein play b5. Sometimes fixing your opponent's pawns is a good idea, taking care of your future self. You never know when it might be a good idea to prevent black from playing g4. And now it's back to business. King c4. And now... White has time for king b5. This is crazy. And what's crazy about this is there's no check on b7. Hebden gives check on e8. Now, black also had a very tempting check. Rook b8 check. And here you see an amazing line. The king walks all the way up to a6. And after rook b6, king a5, it turns out that there are no more checks. And black cannot defend the pawn on f7. The king does it all. So Hebden goes queen e8 check. But now we resort back to the old idea, bishop c6. Queen d8, king first drops back to c4, 
And now it's time for queen d7, which we've already discussed, and the dream has come true. After the queen trade, the king walks right up to d5 and overwhelms black's defense. It's just amazing. Hebden tries to trade on his own terms. He goes queen e6 check, but Psyha says thank you very much. He trades everything. And again, king activity decides the day because the king's going to walk up to a6 and then white will either promote the pawn or win all of black's pawns in the center and on the king's side after forcing the king uh, to walk over to the queen's side. Watch how this unfolds. We don't care about the f2 pawn. That pawn doesn't matter. Uh, absolutely take it. First, Psyhis plays c4, just stopping any kind of d5 shenanigans. And now, king b7. You do not allow black's king to reach c7. Then it would be a draw. He pushes the pawn to b6. Now, it might seem a little bit difficult to get this king out of the way, because if you go to a7, you're just going to end up being pinned. But all that Psy has had to do is move the bishop back, and now the threat of, of king c6 is totally devastating. If black continues shuffling, the king goes up to c6, and if black goes king e7, then at the very least, you can just go b7, king c7, and then you can promote winning the bishop. So Hebden tries a last-ditch attempt d5, Psy has takes it, and it's very clear that he easily stops the pawn with a bishop on b5. And that's indeed what happens. d6, e 3 bishop b5, bishop f6. And now a classic case of two pass pawns kind of overwhelming the defenses. Bishop a6 check. In whichever direction you go, you either allow the king to infiltrate or you allow the pawn to promote. If king d8, then b7. And if king b8, then Psyhis goes king d7. Again, notice that the king is leading. You don't want to go d7 here because then it's going to be hard to cover the d8 square. So you lead with your king, you walk it up to e8, and then you'll be able to promote the deep on Hebden resigned in this position. Just a tour de force. The king does it all in this game. Absolute heroic. So even with the queens on the board, if you are anticipating a queen trade, I'm not saying bring your king from e1 to a7 uh, and then get checkmated there. You got to be very careful about doing that. But notice how even preparing for an endgame can involve bringing the king to the right side of the board. So to summarize, we took a look at five examples where king activity decided the game. All right. In the first one, that's the Capablanca game. We understood that it's not even about the quantity of pass pawns. It's about the quality. And in order to see the pass pawn through to promotion, king activity is often the missing link. It's often worth literally three or more pawns. That's what Capablanca showed. In the second game, we understood that king activity isn't just about bringing the king to the center. But, well, sometimes it is, but what you have to do is chart the right path for the king. You have to understand where the king actually does the most work. And we saw that Akiba Rubinstein understood that the king belongs on h3 here, which allows these king side pawns to march forward and crash their white's defenses. In my game against Benjamin Bach, we saw the king activity is important even with queens on the board, and it can be that missing link because it can relieve the queen of some duties that it simply cannot manage. I walked my king all the way to g7, helping me create the possibility of a pass pawn and putting pressure on f6. Then we saw an example where I, yes, I was really lucky, but I managed to save an endgame a full piece down by activating my king at all costs and creating sudden counterplay against white's passive king. And finally, the position we just saw, we saw left Sahis bringing the king to the queen side into black's territory, literally in a middle game, because he understood that an endgame was coming, and in that endgame, he would need his king to be active. So, uh, hopefully, you know, even before you watch the video, you probably understood that king activity was important. But I hope that these examples really sort of bring out uh, the just absolute irreplaceability of the king in the endgame. So remember to use the king wisely. Again, don't get checkmated. That's possible in the endgame. But I would say that the guiding principle that is true across all endgames, whether it's a pawn endgame or a queen endgame, even if there are three or four pieces on the board, is that your king has to be in the right place because the fewer pieces there are, the less you can afford to have one of your pieces just kind of lounging on a beach. That's what the king does most of the game. But the moment you sense that an end game is near, it's time to start thinking about the king and what it can do. That's our first most important end game principle. And I'll see you in the next video.